The year is 2010, and I'm at Anime Weekend Atlanta. It's Sunday afternoon, and the convention is winding down. I'm having a chat with my friend Wesley, and he mentions an anime recommendation he thought I would enjoy. He says, If you want to see a great classic-style over-the-top shonen series, you need to check out Sengoku Basara. I give it a watch and enjoy it, although I didn't retain much of it at all. Flash forward to 2011 at a little hole-in-the-wall convention called Seishun Con, and my girlfriend at the time and I would run into a mutual friend of ours who is also a fan of Basara. And it was through this friend that I discovered the second season of the show and the video games it was based on. It was at this point I realized the games were part of a small subgenre of games whose formula was derived from Koei's Dynasty Warriors games. A little subgenre known as Warriors or Musou games. Anybody that knows me knows I've been a bit of an apologist for these games over the past few years, a real connoisseur of the genre, if you will, mostly due to my enjoyment of Basara and the Fate series' own in-house Musou game, Fate Extella, which I've already done a video on. I've made no secret that I'm a, a bit obsessed with this game, and it's actually pretty common for my friends and fellow Fate fans to tease me about it, and how upset I get when people only play the first part of it and then stop. Most Musou games come from Koei Tecmo and their studio Omega Force, and are derived from the formula that originated in Dynasty Warriors 2. Over the years, they would start adapting lots of other licensed properties and giving them the Musou treatment, such as The Legend of Zelda, Fire Emblem, Persona 5, Berserk, Fist the North Star, and even One Piece. After a few years of enjoying these games, I would start to notice a bit of a pattern, which was people buying the new adaptations for the intellectual property that they're adapting, be completely unfamiliar with the Musou formula, complain that it's repetitive, and then put it down. And I think this is especially challenging when they're adapting other video game franchises because they expect it to play like the series that it's being based off of, but Hyrule Warriors does not play like a Zelda game, and Fire Emblem Warriors and Persona 5 Strikers are not RPGs. I also noticed that Sengoku Basara's popularity was brief and fleeting while the anime was airing, and it's very difficult to find other people who enjoy the series nowadays. Capcom has essentially stopped making the games, and out of the five mainline games, only two of them got localized in the West. Meanwhile, Koei Tecmo seems to be making a new Musou game every single year, more or less, but in spite of their continual release, it isn't obvious that these games do well or have an audience. When they're reviewed at all by mainstream critics and sites, they usually do very poorly. Notably, Berserk and the Band of the Hawk being named one of GameSpot's 10 Worst Games of 2017. So, ultimately this has led me down this absurdly deep rabbit hole where I plan to find out what's really going on with these games. Is this just Koei Tecmo just printing shovelware on a shoestring budget every year to barely break even, just so they can do the whole thing all over again next year? Or are these games actually a lot more deep and nuanced than people realize? In this series, I'm hoping to find out by playing as many different Musou games as I can tolerate, while also giving myself a convenient excuse to talk about some of my most beloved franchises of all time. From the research I've done, and trust me, I have done a lot of research, I can conclude that, from what we know, these games are much more popular in Japan than they are in the West. They are a very niche genre, not too dissimilar from RTS games or simulation games, where its fans are going to find it and its detractors are going to ignore it. For instance, your average Call of Duty fan is not going to pick up Total War Warhammer on impulse. The fans know what they're getting and they know what they want, and the non-fans don't care to know. Which may explain some of the feelings of alienation with these adaptations, because it's kind of like when Halo Wars came out and caused alienation in its fan base to keep the RTS analogy. Although an argument could be made that by adapting these games into Musou games, the Musou formula lends itself well to adaptation by virtue of being accessible. 
The problem is that Western fans often conflate accessible with simple. But before we get lost in the woods talking about gameplay, we really need to wrap up this point about how the games are received. And in order to do that, we need to talk about sales figures. One thing we have to understand is the Japanese games market is very different from the market here in the West. The AAA market here in the West is so bogged down by extremely high development budgets and marketing costs, it makes it difficult to bet on the middle market. Certain games are seen as a financial failure if they don't sell several millions. Notably, Square was convinced that if Deus Ex Mankind Divided didn't sell more than 6 million copies, it would be considered a failure, which is why there hasn't been a follow-up to that game. But in Japan, there are a lot more studios that operate in what we would consider the middle market over here. Games selling in the hundreds of thousands or even high tens of thousands can still be considered a financial success depending on the franchise and when you consider the size of the market compared to over here. Another thing worth clarifying is that a lot of news sites, journals, and articles can sometimes use a lot of industry jargon when describing sales that makes the data difficult to parse. From what I can tell, since I know this is the case with music albums, there's a difference between units sold and copies sold. A unit is a retail allocation of the product, a box that may contain half a dozen or so copies. A lot of times media publications will try to emphasize units shipped, which ultimately has nothing to do with raw sales of the product. It has to do with how much of the product was allocated from manufacturing to retailers. So with all this established, how well do these games actually sell in Japan? Well, Dynasty Warriors 4 sold 1 million units in Japan in 9 days. That same number took Elden Ring 2.5 weeks. Sengoku Basura 3 sold 243,000 copies on the PS3 and another 50,000 on the Wii. Fate Stella Link actually outsold Koei's own Dynasty Warriors 9 by selling 117,000 copies in its first week. Samurai Warriors 5 shipped 410,000 units. And you can't look anywhere on the internet about sales data about Musou games without being bombarded by the knowledge that Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity sold more than 4 million copies, not only making it the highest selling Musou game in the genre, but also outselling a lot of other major Nintendo titles, including Fire Emblem Awakening. Because, you know, the Zelda franchise is just God's gift to video games, and you're not allowed to like another franchise more than it because it's just perfect in every way. Okay, cynicism aside, I like the Zelda franchise as much as anybody else, but it just is a pet peeve of mine when people are complaining about a Musou game and their only frame of reference is Hyrule Warriors because it's the only other one they've played, and it just becomes their benchmark of quality by default because it's a Zelda game and therefore it must be perfect. Bottom line, these games have an audience, particularly in Japan, and it's an audience that understands that these games are niche and not for everyone, but they still look forward to seeing how the formula can be improved upon and iterated upon. Third-person action games exist on a spectrum, with the Souls games on one end, where every sword swing is a commitment you have to have planned out and calculated in advance, and if you timed your swing wrong, you're punished immediately. Character action games like DMC or a Platinum game exist in the middle, where combat is much more fluid and fast-paced, but it's still incredibly input-intensive. Your ability to execute combos and attacks gets better the more you play the game, and you never really master the game's controls until a subsequent playthrough after the game has slowly drip-fed all of its mechanics to you on your first. Just because your attacks don't take until the heat death of the universe to connect doesn't make the game inherently easy. Musou games exist on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, where every sword swing is an unstoppable typhoon that sees multiple enemies helplessly caught up in the chaos as they're forced to endure this furious onslaught on them and their allies. The appeal is power fantasy and spectacle, and make no mistake, they are absurd and ridiculous. That is, in fact, the entire point. But the casual viewer may take a look at the absurdity and conclude that it's shallow in one note. Thankfully, that isn't the case with most titles. The depth often lies in map design, enemy variety, and difficulty modes as well. The traditional Musou formula goes something like this. You pick a faction and drop into a large map to command your army to victory. You control a general and must hack and slash your way through hundreds of small mob enemies to reach key positions or checkpoints on the map. Each location captured will increase your foothold on the map and your army's morale. Victory is declared when you have defeated the enemy's general. 
The maps are either a sandbox, like this, or like most modern Musou games, have specific objectives you must complete by going to specific locations on the map when the game tells you to. These usually include rescuing an ally, defending an outpost, or defeating a key figure on the enemy faction. The standard soldiers are not meant to represent a threat to you. They're purely there for spectacle as you juggle dozens of them with your powerful attacks. They can cheap shot you in the back if you're exposed, but they're generally low on aggression and don't attack you very much. First time Musou players may be redundantly trying to eliminate every enemy in their line of sight fruitlessly, even though dozens more will continue to spawn in. You're meant to break through their lines to get to the next objective and deal with the tougher enemies along the way. Usually there are larger armored enemies that guard important areas, as well as archers, cavaliers, ballistas, and some games get really weird and experimental with their enemy variety. The games sometimes have a very arcade-style beat-em-up vibe to them, similar to the likes of Final Fight, Streets of Rage, or River City, with power-ups and health pickups located in boxes and crates you can smash. There's also a special attack gauge that fills up as you take and dish out damage. I explained this in my Fate Stella video, but one of the ways Musou games can handle combat, which I feel like is preferable, is by having a long series of combos you can use with your light attack button, and then if you interrupt your combo with a heavy attack, you'll get a unique and different contextual move based on how many times you had used light attack before using heavy. Basically, square square triangle is a different move than just square triangle. This is similar to how most character action games implement it, and it's usually simple to pick up but incredibly satisfying to master. The modern system that a lot of Musou games have opted for is for holding down one of the shoulder buttons to bring up a menu where you can select a combo move by using one of the face buttons. I personally think this is a much worse system that really takes all of the reward out of mastering and executing the combos. It's similar to how every shooter moved towards a two-weapon system rather than letting you carry your full arsenal of weapons. It's one of the reasons I hold games like Basura 3 and Fate Stella in such high regard, although there are some Musou games that use this system well. As we go throughout the series, you're going to see this formula iterate and evolve, but to get an idea of the template that all future Musou games would follow, we need to take a look at its origins in Dynasty Warriors 2. For decades now, one of Koei's flagship series is Romance of the Three Kingdoms, a series of strategy games based off the real-world 3rd century Han Dynasty conflict in China, a series of stories that exist in public domain in regards to writing fiction around it. I am going to botch so many pronunciations in this series. Commenters, just get your keyboards ready. Like, here you go. I have them right here for you. Just take them. In 1996, Koei would create Omega Force as their own in-house studio for making action games. Similar to how Nintendo has retro studios or intelligent systems for specific genres. The first Sangoku Musou game was actually a one-on-one -on -one fighting game similar to Virtua Fighter or Samurai Showdown. Its sequel would release in the West as a launch title for the PS2, and with it, brought the introduction of the Musou formula. When I first played this game, I was shocked to see how many features still prevalent in Musou games to this day were already implemented here in the first entry, such as when your health is critically low, your Musou gauge fills automatically, meaning you have means to push back when you're backed into a corner at dangerously low health. There's an impressive amount of playable characters to choose from, each with their own unique fighting style, and combat is fluid and responsive overall. However, other aspects of this game have not aged well. I played about as much of this game as I could tolerate, and I lost about two-thirds of the footage I recorded. I really didn't want to record more as well, because this is one of those blue CD-based PS2 games, and they're notorious for running horribly, and I didn't want it to break something in my PS2. Just, just hang in there, dude. You're doing great. Just keep it up. But one of the things that playing numerous later Musou games did not prepare me for is this game is hard, and there doesn't appear to be a clear solution to this. The enemies are a lot more aggressive, and your attacks don't catch up as many enemies in the fray as in later games. So you take a lot more damage from cheap shots than you would in later Musou games, and there's scarcely few opportunities to recover from this. 
This difficulty is probably meant to make the game artificially last longer, like from the NES era, as will take multiple attempts to finish a single stage, and for that reason, I can see this being an enjoyable game if I had just gotten home with my PS2 and only played it in small chunks, similar to the first Time Splitters, but unlikely to keep me coming back for hours on end like Jack and Daxter or Gran Turismo 3. After the success of Dynasty Warriors 2, the next game in this series would have an expansion. Extreme Legends would add characters and content and just generally be the more definitive version of the game. Dynasty Warriors 4 would have two expansions, Extreme Legends and Empires, which added a more strategic-based Musou mode where your factions and the enemy factions strategically moved their forces towards different encounters to fight over territory, adding much-needed strategy and replayability to the game. This would be the way the series would continue to release all the way up until Dynasty Warriors 9, which decided to inexplicably add an open-world mechanic to the series, and we all know how that went. Over those many years, Koei would release many more Musou games, and imitators would start to pop up as well. Koei had another strategy series similar to Romance of the Three Kingdoms called Nobunaga's Ambition, set in the Sengoku Jidai in Japan a much more recent and culturally significant conflict to Japan and, frankly, one of the coolest and most fascinating wars in all of human history. Koei would give this series the Musou treatment with Samurai Warriors in 2004. Little did they know that Capcom was working on their own in-house Musou game set in the Sengoku Jidai as well, no doubt inspired by the Dynasty Warriors formula, but not likely a direct ripoff of Samurai Warriors, as this game had to have been in pre-production before Samurai Warriors released. Sengoku Basura released a little over a year later in summer of 2005. Koei would make a crossover series between Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors and call it Warriors Orochi, which I've yet to still get a copy of. I had no idea there were other Musou games based off of other historical periods, so I might look into tracking these down. There's Blade Storm: The Hundred Years' War and Warriors The Legend of Troy, which both sound awesome. There's Warriors All-Stars, another crossover game that apparently did very poorly, but I really want to play it anyway. It's sort of an anniversary celebration of Koei and Tecmo's various franchises, as they all cross over in one Musou game. Then we have all of those franchise adaptations, and I'm going to disappoint some people right off the bat here. I'm not going to play One Piece Pirate Warriors. I'm sorry, I'm not going to get into an argument over whether or not One Piece is enjoyable regarding its length. If you like it, no disrespect, it's just not for me. And playing those games in spite of that would just be doing it a disservice to someone who really loves that series. But I am going to be covering all of these, if not more. There's like just so many here, some of which are in Japanese, and I don't know how I'm going to get through the whole game. But just trust me on this. This is going to be a great series, and I'm really excited about it. But for the next video, we are going to be taking a look at a game that is personally very sentimental to me. It is my introduction to the Musou genre, and it's a remake of an old video that I made a long time ago that is delisted and no one will ever be able to see it, but I'm remaking it from scratch for this series. So for the next video, we're going to be talking about Sengoku Basara and its controversial English localization. Till next time. Okay, so it's it's Sao Sao. Dong Zhou is okay.